It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman. I'd like to welcome back to the show our good friend and author of the book, Social Media Magisterium, a no-nonsense guide to the proper use of media. Sean McAfee, thanks for being here. Is this a live show now? It is live, yeah. It sounds live. You're talking like we're live. This is awesome. Yeah, where are you right now? I am in Middle Earth. No, I, I live in <laughs> Italy, so I'm calling you from uh, about 45 minutes west of Venice. Okay. I'll have to get out the map and put a pin in there for you so we can, we can yeah. visualize that. <laughs> cool. So yeah. y- your book, all about media, not just social media, but media in general, what, what all would you consider to be included in media? Oh, man. Well, the book is kind of directed towards the new media, but the new media is constantly changing, and the, and the book is focused on what the church has had to say about the new media for, since 1936, really, um, hmm. since Pope Pius XI wrote Vigilante Cura, which was an encyclical directed towards what was new media at that time, and that was cinematic media. So that's huh. obviously changed, and the Church's teaching and understanding of media and communications to the world and the masses has, has really matured. Today, the new media mostly consists of what you can access on your smartphone, which is the top three platforms are Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. But really, it also goes to platforms like uh, podcasting and radio and TV and vlogging with YouTube and Vimeo and blogging with blogger.com or our own websites. And before we get into the quote unquote new media, which maybe it's old media by now, but what has been the church's history with media? Well, the church has been communicating with mass media since really the gospel was commanded to be announced at the end of the gospel of Matthew. So the church has created viral content, as I say in the book, through the gospels and through the uh, massive duplication of the epistles of Paul and Peter and, and other apostolic writers like Clement and Irenaeus. And all the way through the Middle Ages, she continued to, the church, she, um, the pronoun, continued to massively produce the Bible so that people across the world can hear it, and also other important letters um, from everything from theological to evangelical and things the saints have written. In the modern age, the church has really taken on the new media, as, as I mentioned, things like Twitter. Pope Benedict XVI with uh, at Pontifex, his Twitter handle, became uh-huh. the first pope. And he was actually held a Guinness World Record for a very short amount of time until other <laughs> media personalities like Katy Perry and whatnot, <laughs> uh, Justin Bieber, got on those those platforms. And so he had the world record for, I think, the first to a million uh, within a very short amount of time, because obviously the Catholic Church is worldwide. But the Church has had a lot to say on the proper use of media and how it can help man reach audiences around the world with the message of, of goodwill and hope in the context of the, I guess, the evangelization of the, the announcement of the gospel and the kerygma. And one of the things you do in the book is you take a look at church documents and church teaching on social media. So what does the Church have to say about our social media use? So the church probably doesn't have uh, much to say directly, uh, like, hey, look, you should be tweeting this, or you should be using (laughs) this in your Facebook status. The church is mostly concerned with the broad elements of how to talk to mankind. So, and that's really the tone that I portray in the book. And it's also a mix of what does she say in other documents, like Pope Paul VI, Encyclical Evangelii Nuntiandi. It's basically his massive doctrine on the announcement of the gospel. So in the book, we discover, you know, what does the Church say is the purpose of of mass communications? Well, it has three purposes. It's to announce the news, to portray what's going on in people's lives, and we can use that in order to accomplish three things. That's to announce the gospel, to give man hope, and then to announce other good news that's fitting of man's good nature, which is like providing hope, providing assistance to other people, encouraging people, and and supporting uh, religious and laity apostolic needs. So are we talking about the personal use of social media or more like organizational use of social media, like our churches and schools and nonprofits and things like that? It's really both. You can't have one without the other, right? So our personal use of the media is is critical, first of all, because we're consumers. 
right? You know, the common question we hear every year is, you know, should we talk about uh, Santa or something on social media? Now those are small questions. But then there's also things like, well, what are we consuming through things like Netflix? Or should we be watching things that are risque or promiscuous or promote bad language or something? Or imagery that's not appropriate for young audiences or even for adult audiences, Mm -hmm. really. But yeah, then there are definitely the concerns that people in the apostolate and priests within their ministries need to probably have a more full understanding. You know, the new media is not about, you know, it's it's a matter of quality and content, right? So quality and quantity. And a lot of people, I think, in, in the new media, they, they go straight for the quantity. You know, they think, okay, I'm not successful until I get my first 1,000 Twitter followers. But the Church teaches us that it's much more about the quality of your content, the quality of your message, which is the message of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if you have one follower, a thousand, or a million followers, like Pope Francis does, that you need to you need to be talking and sharing the good news constantly and consistently and have a message of hope and not a message of, you know, a portrayal of fear of the future and, and that kind of thing. We're talking with Sean McAfee. His book is Social Media Magisterium, A No-Nonsense Guide to the Proper Use of Media. And before we get into what we post and what we put out there, our, our kind of our personal production of media, we're talking about a little bit of our consumption there and the movies that we watch and you know, as far as like language or different scenes and graphic violence or whatever, where do you suggest we draw the line with some of those kind of questionable things? Yeah, that's such a hard question because I think even as Bishop Barron has has acknowledged in his commentary on, on some on some shows, like he had the interview with the um, I can't remember the the homosexual atheist. I, I can't remember the name, but he's a media personality, right? And he he talked to him about The Simpsons, and he could name these episodes and these scenes, which clearly demonstrates not to <laughs> right. say that Bishop Barron binges on The Simpsons, but he has an intellectual and a consumer's understanding of these things. And the church does recognize the importance of of understanding what is in the world, even if you're not letting that world conform you to itself, right? So that comes from the teaching in Intermorifica, which is the Second Vatican Council. So that is actually one of the first documents. It, It was together on the same day produced with the document on the liturgy, divine liturgy. And it contains information in there that directs Catholics to understand and connect with what's going on in the world through the media, but not to be altered, you know, as a person through these things. So whenever we apply that to what we watch and what we consume, we really got to draw a line. What am I watching for my own entertainment? Because that's important. Man does have a desire to be entertained and to be happy and be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But there is also, you know, the influence. What does this cause me to do? What is the behavior that this is influencing with me? So some people, for example, they could watch. Now, I'm going to use this word, and I hope it's not bad for your show, but they can watch things that approach erotica. Uh And I'm not going to name any shows in particular, but they can watch shows or movies with content that approaches that but maybe that doesn't cause them to have any sinful thoughts or cause them to have any sinful behavior. But the most of us, probably 90% of us watching something with, let's say, nudity or erotica in it, it's probably not good for us. We're not really viewing those things without the subtleties that come with temptation. Mm -hmm. So I would probably draw the line at things that cause us to act out or to cause us to come into contact with near occasions of sin. And every person has to draw that line, not to say that morality is relevant to each of us, but those occasions of sin are relative to everybody's personality and everybody's behavior. Everybody has to judge for themselves, not what is right for them, but what causes them to act out in these behaviors. And then there is obviously content like pornography that is wrong for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, everybody... We have, we have different lines of where we draw these things, of course. But I would say that if, if you're coming up on something that, that has that sort of content or influences you to you know, gossip about others or influences you to maybe even have addictions, like you know, increases your vulnerability to drug or alcohol addictions mm-hmm. by, by consuming certain media, then, and that definitely happens. I might, people might be raising their eyebrows right listening, but you know, watching somebody in this addictive behavior that somebody has struggled with does induce somebody the temptation to, once again, participate in that behavior. Sure. That's why 
so many men and women get sucked into, you know, pornography or that sort of addiction through these images is, is it, it sucks them into that, that pleasure and it increases those dopamine trips and whatnot. Um, yeah. So I, I would encourage everybody to just, whenever you're, whenever you're online, even on Instagram or Twitter, or, you know, look at what those, um, what those barriers are to you to progressing in your spiritual life and obviously degressing in your spiritual life by coming into contact with sin. But you're not suggesting that we only watch the God's Not Dead franchise. <laughs> you know, we go through the same thing with my kids. I mean, my kids are six and younger. And um, what, do, what do we let them watch? We let them watch a lot of Pokemon. And I say <laughs> a lot, like maybe once a week, maybe one or two episodes. Uh-huh. But it's supplemented by very wholesome programming. And Pokemon can be good, but it's also kind of addictive. And it's it's also not like character building, you know, I mean, because they're fighting animals, you know, and they're, you, what's the real point of this? But so we supplement any, I guess, secular media that our kids are consuming with very wholesome Catholic programming. Now, we live overseas, so I don't have access to EWTN and a lot of other stuff. So we get creative. We order a lot of DVDs um, to Ignatius Press and through other outlets. So they're watching Brother Francis or mm-hmm. they're watching the Saint stories or they're listening to... Um, Who's the? I, I'm embarrassed. I can't mention their name, um, or I, I can't. I can't think of their name. But they have the the saint stories, um, the glory stories. Oh. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? No, um, I'll check it out. Uh, yeah, they, they're called glory stories, and they highlight a saint, and it's an audio thing. So the kids might listen to that before they go to bed, um, or they actually do a lot of more reading and you know looking at pictures and books than uh, than watching Pokemon and whatever else they want to watch on Netflix. But yeah, so I think that adults really have to do the same thing. They need to temper, I guess, those those things that they consume, you know, the movies and the books and and the media on, on Facebook and whatnot. It really needs to be tempered well, probably with a, a, a more wholesome, you know, Catholic identity built into it. So uh, my wife and I enjoy watching a lot of the AMC programming, like Better Call Saul, or we went through the Breaking Bad franchise, you uh-huh. know, twice. <laughs> and and that was a lot of fun, you know, over the course of several years. Um, but, uh, you know, alongside that, we we make sure that all of that is very tempered with, you know, a lot of reading time, um, enough time to where we're not ignoring our prayer life or enough time to where we're not just, you know, and I mentioned this in the book, binging on one movie as a couple, you know, over the course of several weeks, rather than missing out on that interactive experience that all of us need who are married. Yeah. Well, we spent so much time on what we consume. We didn't even really get into a whole lot about what we communicate with the things that we post. So people are just going to have to check out the book or maybe we can have you back on sometime to talk about that. Where can people get a copy of the book? Go to Amazon.com, search Social Media Magisterium and make sure you check the right format. It's in paperback and it's available in Kindle. All right. Again, it's called Social Media Magisterium, a no-nonsense guide to the proper use of media. Sean McAfee is the author. He also talks about ecumenical dialogue through social media, how we can evangelize. And I I think one of the keys to is how we can evangelize without being the awkward person that's constantly evangelizing on social media. Uh, I think there's probably a balance there. So thanks so much for joining us today, Sean, and uh, sharing a little bit about the social media magisterium. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kyle. Ciao. 